Hey guys, Steve Trowbridge here. So I made an announcement on a Facebook group that uh, includes some of the people that regularly watch my channel. But um, basically, for lack of a better idea to upload to my channel, and just due to kind of lacking the energy to talk about really anything else, I figured I'd continue with the Diane Downs series that I was doing a while back. I think the last part I uploaded was like back in December of last year, so it's been a it's been a minute. Um, but I figured I'd continue doing this reading series because I do want to upload to my channel. I just, you know, I mean, I know there's a, a, several controversies right now, but I honestly just don't feel like getting into them. I just don't have the energy to and. Doing these readings is fun, and it's easy content, so I figured I'd just do this for a while until I, you know, and maybe I'll churn out a video here and there on something different. But I wanted to continue this because I, you know, am interested to see, you know, how this pans out. I mean, uh, if any of you need a refresher, just a quick refresher, um, I mean, you can obviously check out my other three parts of the, of the reading of this book, but this is a memoir, uh by Diane Downs, who was convicted of, in 1984, of murdering her children, or at least uh, the murder of one of her children, and the attempted murder of her two other children. And she was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. And she is still in prison. She tried to get parole in 2008 and 2010, but obviously didn't get it both times. And the 2010 parole hearing is uh, available in its entirety uh, on YouTube, so you can go watch that. Um, but yeah, so and then I had to go back and watch uh, the other, the last part that I did on this series, and, and just to refresh myself. And where I was at last time was uh, it, she was being told that uh, Cheryl, the one that died. She was being told that she uh, passed on, um, that her other two children were going to make it. And she was also, you know, going on about other stuff. Like, towards the end of this chapter, she was uh, talking about all the guys she slept around with and how they're all married and stuff. You know, that's, that's great. Uh, and just talking about all the lovers that she's had and, and then, and just a bunch of stuff that it's just like, whatever, that's just like completely inconsequential to what's, at, what's going on to the bigger picture. So yeah, that's basically where we left off, um, left off, left off, really left off at, I can't apparently speak today, so just forgive me. <laughs> um, but the next part is paralysis, so we'll continue, get on, get the show on the road here in a second. I'll take a drink. Alright. Alright, paralysis. <clears throat> After stopping in Christy's room Monday morning and seeing she was still fast asleep, I went to Danny's room and found Steve and and an investigator from the district attorney's office named Paula uh, uh, Krogdow holding Danny. Tracy walked in before I had a chance to talk to Danny and said he wanted me back at the scene and then to videotape a reenactment of the shootings. Yeah, and you can also find... Uh, I don't know if the reenactment of the shooting is uploaded in full on YouTube, but you can find like clips of it and like it's, it's in a uh, compilation of interviews with Diane Downs. Um, and to me, that was really telling, too, because during the reenactment, she's, like, laughing and, like, and she's, again, she's obviously enjoying the attention that she's getting from all this, but it's just, it's very bizarre, it's very chilling, it's just, it's like, you know, this is a woman who has just lost one of her children, and then another one of her children is going to be basically crippled for the rest of his life, and then the other one, the other one, I think, suffered, like, stroke, so, like, she lost, she had to slowly rega regain back, you know, just the, you know, being able to talk and whatnot. Um, I think it's, she suffered a stroke, I think that's what it was, but, but anyways, you know, she's just, you can see it on YouTube, you can probably find a clip of it, like I said, but she's just laughing and, and, and joking around and stuff, so, I mean, just like her, in, in her other interviews, so it's like, 
<clears throat> uh, just, I didn't stop to think about why they would need to do such a thing or realize that they'd use it to tie me down to a set of facts. Then seek to confuse me about those facts. My mind was on my children and I didn't want to go with Tracy, but I agreed. Uh, I visited Danny once more before I left the hospital and asked again to hold him. I was at first shocked and then furious when the nurse said no, that I couldn't hold Danny. Uh, we think he may be paralyzed, she said. That couldn't be so, I said, trembling. Danny was moving his legs from the moment he was brought into the hospital, and when Steve and the nurses had been playing and roughhousing with him, how could he be paralyzed? Wait. And then Steve and the nurse, uh, nurses had been playing and roughhousing with him. Okay. Um, the nurse, the nursing reports confirmed what I was saying. The emergency flow sheet timed at 1030 the night of the shootings minutes after their arrival at the hospital states patient moaning, moving extre extremities. May 19th, 1145 PM moving continues to moan. Uh, May 20th, 2 PM moves lower extremities to painful sensation and can voluntarily wiggle toes. Uh, May 20th, 4.15 p.m., circulation good to fingers and toes, can feel toes being touched. Uh, May 21st, 1 a.m., um, patient will move legs with stimulus. May 22nd, Dr. Foster notes Danny making progress and moving his legs. Issues written instruction to nurses that Danny, quote, may stand by bedside to void. May 23rd, 1.30 p.m., patient could definitely wiggle toes. Now, three days after the shooting, Danny was having only partial withdrawal to noxious stimuli, such as a pinprick in the foot. The report of May 23rd at 6 p.m. was most distressing to me because it so flatly contradicted all the others, especially the one written only four and a half hours earlier. Quote, patient has not moved legs since May 20th when he was observed to have toe movement and withdrawal to uh, noxious stimuli, no spontaneous movement, no response to noxious stimuli, flaccid. There was no way around it. Danny was paralyzed, and though in the coming days, doctors, uh, doctors would insist that the shooting was the direct cause of Danny's paralysis. I had seen him move when Steve and the nurses were playing with him, and I knew that at, le I knew that at the least the movement of my son had made a bad situation worse. The doctors had been confident upon their examinations of him that the bullet, while close, didn't enter the spinal column itself. But now they were saying the sac surrounding the spinal column had been severed and that Danny was suffering from a um, mid-thoracic cord transic transection with um, paraplegia and spinal shock. In simple terms, it meant he was paralyzed from the waist down, and there was no way of knowing how long, if ever, it would take to recover the use of his legs. Yeah, that's what happened to her son, uh, whom, by the way, was was three years old at the time of this, so. <laughs> um, all right, next section, Grim Reminder. I checked out of the hospital early Monday morning and was wheeled outside into the bright sunlight. It had been three days since I had been outside. I'd felt safe in the hospital, but now the prospect of leaving my children behind in the hospital scared me. I was afraid for my kids and terrified that I would again see the man who had shot them. Yeah, okay. Um, my wheelchair cleared the doors, and I shook with a terror I could not control. Oh, I'm sure you did, Diane. Uh, Doug Welch was by my side as he had been since the night of the shootings and saw me trembling. What's the matter, Diane? Welch asked snidely. I was about to scream at him, but for once in my life, I held my tongue and let my mother take me home. All the way home, I thought about how strong I was going to have to be during the next few days. <coughs> Arrangements for Cheryl's funeral were yet to be made, and I knew I wouldn't be able to count on Steve for any emotional help. Uh, Steve Downs, her ex-husband. Um... My mother tried to lift my spirits and tell me everything was going to be all right, and I had regained my strong frame of mind by the time she pulled into the driveway. But when I walked into the living room, my resolve of strength dissolved like fresh snow in a warm rain. The day of the shootings, Cheryl had bought balloons and lab laboriously printed I love you, Mom, on them, blown them up, and spread them around the house to surprise me when I came home from work. 
I had been delighted with the balloons. It was the kind of thing Cheryl was always doing. My mother had returned home from the hospital the night Cheryl was murdered, and the balloons were floating throughout the quiet house, grim reminders that Cheryl was gone. It was more pain than she could bear, and so she walked slowly from the room from room to room, armed with a straight pin, popping each balloon. I walked into the house and saw the jagged pieces of the colored balloons everywhere. I looked. Now, like my life with my children, Cheryl's messages of love lay in tatters at my feet. Uh, my diary entries remind me of all the things I was trying to deal with. <clears throat> Get out of the hospital today. Went with Tracy and Doug to reenact crime on video. Drove the route the kids and I drove. Checked time, checked time and speed. Uh, Steve tried to attack me at the hospital. My dad stopped him. Paula soothed him. I guess he got tired of the nurse. Uh, went to funeral home to discuss arrangements for Cheryl. Steve, not very cooperative. Uh, I will pay all expenses. Paula can't keep her hands off Steve, yet she is cold to me. Terrible look in her eyes. I thought she wanted to help. Uh, Danny went to Sacred Heart. Well, I would imagine, um, and I know that the ex-husband, Steve Downs, wasn't perfect either, but I would say, I would venture to say that he was definitely more of a fucking human being than Diane, Down Diane Downs was. So he probably isn't very you know, cooperative or very, you know, because he's probably devastated because he, you know, because one of the kids was biologically his, the other two were, uh, he kind of just took under his wing and kind of like raised as his children, as took it as his own children. So he was probably very devastated at, at what just happened to them. So that's probably, that's probably why he's not cooperating, uh, very well and why he is the way that he is. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's just like you're just, you're so ready to just proceed with things and, you know, whatever. <sighs> okay, next section. Reenactment. Only hours after leaving the hospital, I was back at the scene with Tracy and Welch. Tracy drove all the way out uh, Sunderman Road to Carolyn's house. I think there should have been a two in there. Drove all the, drove all the way out to Sunderman Road to Carolyn's house. <clears throat> he turned around at the end of Carolyn's gravel driveway, beginning the same drive I had made the night of the shootings. As he drove, I implored Tracy to slow down, but I hadn't been driving that fast. I had told the detectives that I had left Carolyn's house at almost 10 o'clock. Now they were attempting to show that it took far less time to drive the route than I claimed it had taken that, that night. They were going to claim there was a 25-minute time gap during which I disposed of the gun. The time loss was a major reason to target me as a suspect. Yeah, because from, if, from what I remember, she, after the shooting happened, it took her a lot longer to drive to a hospital that wasn't that far away. Like, she took her sweet time getting to the hospital. My guess was probably because she was she was taking her sweet time, so that way the kids would hopefully die, in her mind. Um, but it would make but she still drove them there, so it would make it seem like that she still was trying to get them help. But she took a while. Now, of course, you know a logical person, as someone who wasn't you know a psychopath or a sociopath, um, would think that that she'd be trying to get there as fast as she could, but she was um, apparently taking her sweet-ass time getting her kids to the hospital. So, I mean, what the detectives are doing here uh, is isn't is would be the accurate amount of time it would take to get to the next the hospital or the next destination. <clears throat> so it's showing that she took her sweet-ass time, which is a major red flag. Um... What steered Tracy and Welch in my direction was the report of uh, Joseph Inman, who said he had been driving on Old Mohawk Road that Thursday night and come up behind a small red car. Inman had to brake quickly because the car was only, go was only doing about five miles an hour. He stayed behind for a short time because he couldn't see ahead of the red car, but when, visi when visibility improved, he passed. 
What was strange, Inman said, was that he couldn't see anyone in the car, not even a driver. If Inman did, did see my car on Old Mohawk Road, the reason he couldn't see anyone is that Cheryl was on the floor in the front, Danny was thrown on the seat in the back, as was, as was Christy, and all were shot. I was leaning across the car to open the passenger window, bent over, and Inman couldn't see me. Tracy and Welch put a lot of stock in Inman's statement, taking it as strong evidence that I had purposely driven as slowly as possible. I mean, uh, speak to reason. Um, if that were the, if that were true, the only reason would be to allow time for the children to die before I reached the hospital. Exactly, and I think that was exactly your intention. Uh, they returned to the country, the county shops where my car was being held, and John Peckles videotaped me as I reenacted the shootings. Tracy watched me glance in the mirror of the car and check my hair before they started and made a mental note of it. Well, of course they would. They would make a mental note of that. They're 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 they're, they're studying and focusing on your behavior post shootings to see how you're dealing with it. Most people. Most parents in that situation would not be concerned with how they look or how, or you know, what they, they wouldn't because they would be in a state of, of just absolute devastation and suffering and sadness and shock and just, and everything. So yes, they would make a mental note of that. The videotape was important because it made a permanent visual record of my story. It put me on the record once and for all as to what happened on the road. In the coming days of intense interrogation, Tracy Welch and the others would use the videotape again and again to raise doubts in my mind about what happened. This doesn't fit, Diane, they'd say. Or, think about it, Diane, you're, tr you're not trying. There's too many holes. Until I started to doubt everything I remembered about that night. And again, she could never keep her story consistent. Like, if you listen to what she said um, ba back in the 80s when she was first convicted, and then you actually listen to her uh, parole hearing in 2010, there's different details thrown in there. The only detail that stays consistent is that when she drove, the door shut by itself. Like, for example, in her, two th in her 2010 parole hearing, she mentions that she was that she had a boyfriend, uh, whereas before in other interviews she never mentioned that whatsoever when recounting, you know, what happened that day and whatnot. So, <coughs> excuse me. All right, next section, Steve and Paula. I finished with the reenactment and one of the detectives drove me home, but I spent only a few minutes there before returning to the hospital. Christy was able to shake her head yes or no to my questions, but still didn't speak a word. That worried me as much as Danny now being unable to move his legs. I'd been told that Danny had been transferred to Sacred Heart in Eugene early, um, early that morning, but someone got the message wrong. As I was visiting Christy, Danny was in his room right there at McKenzie uh, Willamette. They hadn't moved him and wouldn't until 7 that evening, but no one told me so I didn't go and so I didn't go to his room. Uh, Danny wondered why I didn't come and kept asking the nurse, uh, you know, where's my mommy, where's my mommy, and I, and I had been there all along. I had Cheryl's funeral arrangements to make, and just before, I had Cheryl's funeral arrangements to make. Um, now see, that right there, like, it's only, what, three days after the shooting, and she's already going into making Cheryl's funeral arrangements, like, like, already. Now, again, I could be completely wrong, I could be completely full of shit on this, but I would think that, again, the parent would not be ready that quick to be making funeral arrangements, like, whatsoever. They'd still be grieving and whatnot. I would think, anyways. But, again, I could be completely wrong on that. Um, and just before leaving the hospital for the funeral home, I stood talking with my sister-in-law. I could see Steve, Paula, and my dad through the window as they stood talking outside on a small patio. Steve looked up, saw me, and suddenly rushed at me with his clenched fist raised in the chair. God damn her, she's always laughing at me, he bellowed. 
My father thrust a strong arm in front of Steve and stopped him. Steve was absolutely livid, in a veritable rage. Paula uh, Krogdal, uh, Krogdal, that's a weird last name, hadn't seen the sight of Steve and didn't suppress her urge to soothe him. She took his hand and tried to calm him down, only partially succeeding. No one could figure out what had set Steve off like that, but everyone, Paula included, agreed I hadn't been laughing at him or anyone else. She could have had, I mean, if, if, if this even happened, of course, if, if Diane isn't bullshitting, um, I would think that maybe Diane maybe had, like, Duper's Delight on her face or something, which is basically when someone is trying to cover up a lie, there, there'll be, like, a hint of a smile, and that might have been, she might have, she may have been making that expression at him, who knows, but, I don't know, anyway, it's just a theory, um, all right, next section, which is really short. Uh, recollection, Wes and Willa Fredrickson. Wes, quote, Steve and Paula became good friends right from the very beginning. She was always the comforting mother hen to him. I watched her, and my perception was that she was very kind to him, while she treated Diane like she was dirt. It was obvious to me that Paula was on Steve's side in this thing and that she despised Diane. Probably because she could see Diane for who she really was. Uh, Willa, quote, I know Paula was influenced by Steve because he was so outspokenly anti-Diane. He kept saying, I know she did it, I just know. Hmm. Alright, next section. Funeral arrangements. So soon after the shootings. <laughs> um, the funeral director spoke somberly about Cheryl like she was dead. Uh, I still didn't believe it, but stark reality was only moments away. Steve and Paula were there, too, sitting side by side on a little love seat. I was struck by the image of Steve on a love seat. It just didn't fit. No one reached out to me, hugged me, or said any comforting words. By myself, I went about the business of burying my daughter. I looked at the dress my mother had bought, and we began to discuss the cost for the funeral services. I'm not going to pay for this, Steve suddenly declared. I don't want your money, I said forcefully, not even bothering to look at Steve. I was physically and emotionally exhausted and just wanted him to go away. He had no business being there at all. Really? Uh, okay. Um, he hated Cheryl and never cared about the kids before any of this happened. I mean, really? I I don't know if I believe that entirely. Um, because that kind of contradicts other things, that other claims that have been made. Um, he was there for show and he was there for Paula and that was it. I said I wanted Cheryl to be cremated and Steve flew into a rage declaring that he couldn't allow it. That he wouldn't allow it. I don't have the money to buy a plot. If you want to have her buried, go ahead, but you'll have to help me pay for it, I told Steve. I was so exhausted, I just wanted this over with. I wanted Cheryl back is what I wanted. Steve decided cremation would be fine. The funeral director asked if I wanted to see Cheryl, and though I didn't want to face it, I said yes. The memory flooded back to when I was 16 and my grandparents were killed in an auto accident. I wanted to see Cheryl, no, I didn't want to face it. Memory flooded back to when. So, again, like, you are faced with your dead daughter, and the first thing that comes to your mind is a memory of what you went through. But again, I mean, as someone, of, as someone with her condition would, you know, as it would dictate, but... <sighs> when I was 16, my grandparents were killed in an auto accident. My father took all the children to see the car they were killed in and, and view them in their caskets. The sight still haunted me to this day. We walked into the viewing room, and I stared at the, my daughter laying, lying silent in front of me. I finally accepted the fact that everything they said was true. It was strange. It looked like Cheryl. Her hair was the right color. Her skin was the right texture. 
But even when Cheryl slept, she was never that still. Even when Cheryl slept, she always grinned. Until now. But her bangs were wrong, and without thinking, I reached out to straighten them. I wasn't ready for what I felt. They had just taken Cheryl's body from a refrigerator. I touched my dead daughter's forehead and felt, the cold, and felt the coldness. It was that touch that finally made it real. I'd say she was probably glad because... And she was probably horrified in all reality that the two other kids survived because that would that would have just been... I mean, not so much in the son's case because he was like a th toddler at the time, basically, but at least in the daughter's case because I believe Cheryl was like the middle child. Christy was the oldest kid, so... It's just another, it's just, it's an eyewitness that could put her away, which is what happened in the end. Uh, next section, funeral. Uh, Paula came to the funeral with Steve and sat in the family section like she belonged there. My brother John uh, turned around and said loud enough for all of us to hear, some people shouldn't sit in the family section who aren't family. But Paula didn't take the hint. John got furious and took my father outside and said, get her the hell out of here. Get her, get her the hell out of there. <clears throat> my father was on his, way back, on his way back in to ask Paula to leave when she and Steve went outside together. All I could think about were my kids. I couldn't stop crying at Cheryl's funeral. Yeah, I find that hard to believe. I always kept it in. I never cried in front of in front of anyone, but when I saw Cheryl, I cried in front of God and everyone. I asked Jason to send a dozen red roses for me when I was in the hospital, and they were delivered before the funeral service began. I took one of the roses and put it beside her, and then I kissed her forehead and fainted. After the service was over, I was standing in the, in the chapel, and I was dying inside, and Steve was outside with Paula. I knew it would be the last time I ever saw Cheryl, and I knew it shouldn't be. I wailed and I sobbed, and my brother Paul, or wait a minute, I wailed and I sobbed, and my brother Paul went out to get Steve. See, I don't even know if I was aware that she had, like, siblings, though. Like, she probably does, but I, I, I don't know, I never knew that detail. Um, he told Steve if there was ever a time he should be nice to me, it was now. Steve came in and put his hands on my shoulders. I hated him so much, and at his touch, all that all that hate had a place to go. I didn't show it. I was controlled, but inside I was like a, a little tiny coal. And my will to live slowly began to return. Uh, the next section, Christy. Dr. Miller, one of Christy's physicians, told me Christy was bright in the eyes, but not verbalizing. She had only She had only slight movement of her right arm and leg, and was frustrated because she couldn't speak. Her calcium level was too low, and a CAT scan of her brain showed an area of dead or dying tissue, usually caused by blockage of the blood vessels. No blockage was revealed in, the, in Christie's CAT scan, and, and doctors thought perhaps the tissue loss was caused by the calcium deficiency. I spent the entire night sitting in a straight-backed chair, half-draped ac uh, half across Christie's bed while the police guards sat right by her. I watched my daughter, the guard watched me, and Christy slept peacefully. She had no nightmare and never cried out in her sleep all night. <clears throat> While I had returned to the scene, driven the route, done the video, made the funeral arrangements, and then gone to see Christy, I hadn't had time to get to Sacred Heart, where I thought Danny was. The Danny's nurse and Mackenzie, Will uh, Mackenzie Willamette thought... I didn't care about Danny when I didn't visit him all day. I had been there every single day but this day. In her nursing care record under Psychiatric Social, the nurse reported, Father here most of most of day, Mother has not been in. And I would say that's probably because she didn't come to visit him. I think that she probably knew where he was, but I would say that she probably just, it just didn't, you know. That would be my guess. Now, again, could be completely wrong, but based on what I've seen and the interviews that I've seen and just her general demeanor and just who she is as a person, I would say she probably just didn't come to visit him. <clears throat> uh, 
Christy awoke the next morning and saw that her mother was not there by her side and said her first words since she had been shot. Mama? For days, Christy had cried in frustration at not being able to say what she wanted to communicate. Patient awake, very agitated, unable to tell what's, what's the matter, grabbing for air and pointing all around the room, wrote the nurse. Probably because she was in a state of panic. Because she would be afraid that her mother was there. Who shot her. <laughs> um, this had happened once before when Steve and Paula were in the room visiting Christy and the nurse wrote it in her report. Christy pointed to the door with her left hand. The cast limited the use of her fingers, but even at that they could see that she was pointing at the door. She's making a gun with her hand, Steve announced, like he knew it for sure. Are you making a gun, Christy? asked Paula. Christy sighed deeply, shook her head no, and dropped back on her pillow, exhausted from her effort. Steve and Paula misunderstood her, and Christy was never able to make her need known. I returned soon after Christy awoke that morning and found Paula uh, Krogdow sitting in the chair by my daughter's bed. Paula made no secret of her dislike for me. Paula wasn't alone with Christy. Fred Hugie, a young assistant direct, uh, a young assistant district attorney for Lane County, and the Lane County Sheriff Deputy uh, Roy Pond were with her. There was only one reason for them to be there: to interrogate Christy. But Christy couldn't even speak. The nurse's patient care record for neurological made that clear. Attempting to talk says yes, no, I don't know. Easily frustrated because of aphasia and inability to walk to talk excuse me i spoke up as i entered the room and christy turned in the direction of my voice she grinned and raised her hand to me i reached out but paula quickly grabbed christy's hand took it in her own and brought it back down to the blankets paula taunted me with a smug self-assured smile and maternally patted christy's hand christy sank back in the bed and paula glared at me if you don't like me here, just ask me to leave, said Paula, correctly assessing the situation. I felt so defeated I was about to cry. The police weren't making any effort to find the man who'd done this. They talked about me behind my back and said I was a murderer, and now Paula was coming between me and Christy. Christy had become agitated when Paula took her hand, and now she was upset because the elastic band on her oxygen mask was pulling her hair. Christy was trying with all her might to loosen the trapped hair, but, but her right arm was paralyzed and the cast on her left arm made it too cumbersome to use. Hughie and Paula made no move to help Christy, so I reached out to fix the hand, to fix the band, excuse me, but the cast on my own arm was in the way. Hughie stood watching me, so I said, Would you please help me? Help Christy? If you can't quit upsetting Christy, you should leave, Diane, Hughie ordered. I finally freed the trapped hair and Christy settled back on her pillow. I went outside and stood by myself crying. But only minutes later I, I was back in Christy's room. Paula and Hughie were still there so I sat confidently by Christy's bed. What are you doing? Hughie demanded. I'm not going to be chased off from my daughter's side by anyone. I told Hughie defiantly. I love her and I'm staying. I don't care how unpleasant you want to make it for me. Hughie and Pond left together, and several minutes later, Paula left. Next section, Danny. I spent a hectic day Tuesday shuttling between hospitals, first with Danny and then with Christy. At Sacred Heart, uh, doctors did two hours of exploratory surgery on Danny's back. The doctors wouldn't allow me in the operating room, but did allow a policeman to be there. I stood outside the operating room and cried so hard and so long that finally a nurse led me to a small room where I would be alone because my crying was bothering others. I just, I find it, again, I know I'm repeating myself, but I find it very hard to believe that she spent all this time, you know, crying and, and you know, grieving and whatnot. Especially when, you know, so far this entire book has mostly just been about, you know, how, she, how much of a victim that she is and, you know, going off about and talking about frivolous things and, and things that are, again, are just inconsequential to the main picture, like all the flings that she's had and whatnot, so. The next day, Danny was back in the operating room for reconstructive surgery to repair the spinal sac that had been torn. It was clear that the sac had been torn by a bullet fragment, but it was not at all clear when. 
It didn't seem likely that the tear was immediate because Danny had feelings in his feet and could move his legs for three days after the shootings. Before the doctors could begin, they needed a fresh set of x-rays. Since the night of the shootings, I had not been allowed to spend even one moment alone with either of my children. The police would not allow it, and the nurses at Mackenzie Willamette became deputies who enforced the edict. And I can understand why. Again, because of your behavior, because of how you've reacted to all this, I could perfectly understand why they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't want you around the children. Because it comes off like you really just couldn't care less. Like this is all an inconvenience for you. But whenever a camera's on, whenever, whenever there's a camera around, okay, you're laughing, you know, joking around. In one interview talking about how you couldn't tie your shoes for two damn months, you know. Like I said, someone like Diane, of course, who was a, who was a narcissist, loves the attention. Even with something like this. Um, before the doctors could begin, they needed a, f uh, since the night of the shootings, but now as they went into the x-ray room, the nurse stopped the police guard and, and wouldn't let him in the room. He stood in the hall and waited for them to come out. Danny cried for me to go with him for the x-rays, and although I begged to go, the nurse said it wasn't good for me to be exposed unless it was medically necessary. I don't care about the x-rays, they're not going to hurt me, I said. Let me go in and be with my son, please. Danny was crying pitifully for me. Surely the nurse would let me stay with him. But the nurse would not, and so I left the room for each separate x-ray, and each time I left, Danny cried and begged me to stay with him. Danny kept crying and moving, and the technician couldn't get a clear shot until the third x-ray. <sighs> Fucking poor kid. Um... The x-rays didn't take long, and, went, and then Danny was t taken into the operating room. I followed, and so did the guard, only to be told again to wait outside. He stood in the hall and made no attempt to hide his anger at being told by a nurse what to do. Okay. When I went to visit Danny after surgery, I found Paula and Steve with him. Paula stood on one side of Danny's bed, Steve on the other, and Danny was crying and, and fussing and wouldn't cooperate with their pleas for him to calm down. I can't do a goddamn thing with him, Steve swore as I came into the room. Danny saw me and cried, Mommy, Mommy. I politely asked Paula to leave, and she did so without a word. I laid my head on Danny's pillow and said, Danny, don't cry. But it hurts. I know, Danny. Sometimes getting well has to hurt. <sighs> uh, Danny quieted down, and after a few minutes w was back asleep, but not before asking where Cheryl and Christy were and why they couldn't come see him. I didn't tell Danny where his sisters were. Just looking at... Alright, I think I'll stop there for now. Um, I've been going for about 38 minutes. Um, it's going to take a while to upload this to YouTube. I can upload longer videos now to YouTube. But, like I said, it's going to take a while to upload this in full. So I'll go ahead and stop there, but... Yeah, um, uh, all the stuff with Steve and Paula I don't really buy because, you know, by all accounts, except for Diane's, like, Steve actually did care for the children, but he chose not to take them in after this whole mess because he felt that he couldn't give them a proper, like, upbringing, and so the prosecutor who, uh, the prosecutor who, um, got Diane convicted actually ended up adopting the kids, so... So that guy's a saint, of course. Um, and again, I mean, it's 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 just it's all about Diane. It's it's not she she again. She tries to act like she cares so much about what's happened and about the kids and like she's devastated. But I, I just I don't believe it. Again, you look at the interviews that she's been in. The behavior contradicts just everything that she's saying right now. And again, the little details like her saying that I hope that she hopes that the car that it happened in is okay, that it didn't get scratched or anything because it's a new car, um, or her checking herself in the mirror to make sure she she's looking all right or whatever. I mean, it's just little things like that that, again, set off alarms. So, 
yeah, I, I don't, I don't buy, and I don't buy that Christie was was wanting her at bedside, um, because I think that she probably would have been horrified um, of Diane, you know. So, anyways, except for this one, I'll be trying to do more of these readings uh, more continuously. I might just start uploading these readings like back to back for a little bit. Um, and I might upload a video like in between here and there. So when I find something else to talk about, so anyways, uh, peace, have a good day and 